Hello, I'm Adam Benson, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I did the video for Nothing New. Uh, I used uh, DaVinci Resolve for a lot of my color correction and editing. Um, and instead of using Fusion, because uh, while I was a Fusion compositor many, many moons ago, um, these days, and, and honestly for most of my career, I've primarily been a Nuke compositor, so um, whenever I'm doing composite work, I prefer to work in Nuke. Um, I find it to be faster than Fusion. Um, some of the things in Fusion are really good, but a lot of them, eh, whatever. I'm not denigrating on Fusion at all. Uh, but I really like the way that DaVinci Resolve handles um, editing and color correction. So I did a lot of my initial setup there, doing doing the timeline in Fusion, but the, or in Resolve, rather. But then um, after that, I took everything into Nuke to do my basic Nuke compositing setup. Uh, for this particular thing, because I, I only have a limited amount of time, um, I work full-time at Marvel as a CG supervisor, and so I don't have time during the day to do a lot of this, and a lot of my other side projects take up a fair amount of my time as well. Um, not, n nonetheless, recording music, and um, I work on writing projects as well. So, in this particular case, I needed to get a music video done quickly that looked aesthetically nice, but at the same time didn't take me a long time to build. I knew that I wanted something that had a little bit of a paper cutout, hand-drawn look, but again, um, I don't want to spend a, a team of ten people three to six months building a music video, when I think a lot of this I was able to do much faster just by using quicker methods. So, in this particular case, uh, my biggest challenge was twofold. When I shot the video, uh, I shot it almost as, uh, as an afterthought. I had this, this idea for a song walking around in a grocery store, and came home, immediately recorded it, and was like, you know, I need to, I need to put this out as a music video. Now, at the same time, I'm working on another music video for my Quarantune albums for the song uh, Old Time Machine Clock, uh, but that one's a little more ambitious and was taking a bit of time, so I decided to derail myself on that project to quickly do a video for this one uh, using nothing more than a GoPro and, uh, and Nuke to try to develop this look. So shooting as an afterthought, I set up as many camera angles as I could as quickly as possible, and then when I got into the editing session, I realized that in my rush, I had done a bad job with with making sure that my lighting was consistent and that uh, my shot composition lended itself well to this. So I needed a solution that would allow me to to effectively rotoscope myself out without having to rotoscope out 130 something shots. I think maybe it was 120 shots. Uh, if, you, if you've ever done rotoscope before, you know that it's very time-consuming. Um, it can be very... Uh, it does a better job than a green screen on some things. Uh, but in this particular case, I didn't yet have a green screen set up in the house. So, um, I decided to give Nuke's new nodes the copycat a try to see if I could get the machine learning algorithms to do what uh, Rotoscope would not, and I found that it was mostly successful. There was a few places where my poor lighting conditions and bad composition, and I'll admit to those, didn't lend itself well to using Copycat, but that being said, um, it really served me well in getting the, the Rotoscope that I needed without a lot of extra work. Uh, and where it didn't work, I had only a few minutes of, of relatively easy garbage roto to fix up what Copycat didn't get right in the first place. So, with that being said, let's dive right in and start taking a look at how I built Nothing New. One of the things that I like to do when I'm working in DaVinci Resolve is to take a series of clips that I have shot that um, effectively are 
one shot after the next where it's multiple takes of different cuts and different angles and then put them together in uniform instruments so that instead of trying to go through these a shot at a time and figure out where things are, it's, it's easy enough to put them all into um, various states of multi-cam tracks, which are truly wonderful. Because in a multi-cam track, what I effectively get is instead of having every shot individual, I can sync them up in DaVinci Resolve and put them into, into a full multi-cam track where I can effectively, they're all synced up at the same time, so at any point in the song, I can just go through and take a shot, like let's see here. Let's take, uh, what's, a, what's a good one? Let me, let me go through here. Let's take this shot here. If I don't like this particular bass note, I can right click on it, go to, t to switch multicam clip and switch to any other angle in the bass guitar. So if I know that I want the bass guitar there, I can choose really quickly which angle I'm using and I know that it's already lined up with everything else in the clip which makes this a super fast and easy way to edit a video together because then effectively what I do is I'll stack all of my video clips together and then start cutting them until I get the chops that I want and then replace them with whichever angle I think is best for that moment in time. And then after that, of course, uh, I get my edit lock and then I'll collapse these down into something that's a little easier to manage so that I get a timeline that looks more like this, where it's all on one plane. And then, <laughs> then it's more about just getting out the shots that I want into the effects so that I can do the final edit work. And then what I end up with is, well, this is, the, this is the reduced clip before I go into the editing. Although I, you can see some, some early tests I did to try to get the look of this right before I, before I settled on one. And in the reduced clip, I'm basically moving all of my selections down to the first track while still leaving the other ones dead if I want to go back and change something. And then once I get this into a single timeline with all the shots that I want, then I'll go through. Then I'll go through and I'll do the effects work. So for this particular project, I had a lot of shots where I knew I was going to need to rotoscope myself, and in some, here I've got a black shirt on a black background, so that was going to be tricky. And I was hoping that Copycat would be able to do what I wanted without uh, killing myself and it did a mostly good job I think had I planned this a little better it would have been even more accurate than what I got but because I shot this video as a bit of an afterthought you know I got what I got out of it but ultimately I'm really pleased with the results so let's go in and start talking about how I set up copycat to do the rotoscope to separate myself from the rest of the video Okay, so in order to do the copycat, first thing I need is a piece of footage. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to find the plate that I want to work with. And in this case, um, oh, nope, that's not the right folder. My bad, it would be under plates. Uh, in this case, you know, let's go with, uh, yeah, I think shot 35 is probably fine for this. Um, yeah, there we go. Give me a nice plate to work with. And you can see here, as I play through this, it's just uh, a relatively badly lit uh, GoPro footage. Does the job that I needed it to, especially since I knew that I was going to heavily affect all of these shots without, without worrying about how the plates themselves looked. So while I should have spent more time on the lighting, and on previous videos I certainly have, this lighting works just fine for what I need it to. So, how do I use Copycat to do a roto? Well, the first thing about Copycat is that you actually have to do some roto on it. Now, I like to work in, in uh, 
2001 to whatever the end of the plate is. And, and if your footage doesn't start there, you can start it off with the expression changing that to start to. So you get your 1001. And that, that generally comes from working in, in visual effects where you occasionally might need some pre-roll. So it's always better to start at 1001 than at 1. Now the first thing I need to do is take a shuffle node and get rid of the alpha. I need it on a black background alpha because I don't want to have an alpha channel coming through here as I'm doing the copycat. So the next thing I want to do is do a frame range. And I set this straight to 1001 to 1001 um, specifically because I really don't care about the frame range so much as I want to make sure that the copycat knows where it's starting his stuff off. So I'm going to set this to 1001. There we go. And now it's time to start doing some simple techniques. And the way you do this is you set up a frame hold and then you do a rotoscope on that frame hold. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start by creating a frame hold node. Uh, hit the tab key. There we go. And type frame hold. There we go. And because this is already at frame 1001, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. I'm going to create a dot because I like to keep things clean and organized. Now I'm going to hit the O key to create a rotoscope node. There we go. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go ahead. Let me make some more room here. I'm going to quickly go ahead and trace myself uh, with as many points as I can without being overly elaborate. I don't want too many points because then it becomes unwieldy. But I'm going to go through here and rotoscope myself as quickly as I'm able to just give myself enough information to to. There we go. Get the get the roto I need. Now I'm going a little bit in on my hair, and I'll show you why in just a few seconds as I go and clean this up. Now while I'm trying to keep enough points to make this functional, I'm actually not too interested in being hyper accurate at this point because a little bit of sloppy is okay, and Copycat can work with that. I want to try to make it as accurate as possible in the in the end, but for the moment, I'm just trying to get this basic shape cut out. Now sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually cut this into separate parts where I'll roto my head separate than my arm, separate than my torso, and you get some control out of that, but in this particular case um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, get the basic shape. Now I'm going to zoom in here and then I'm going to start feathering out the edges around where it gets blurry or the depth of field, the, the bit of me that's not quite in focus. And that's what I'm going to do to the hair above as well, as you'll see. Uh, this helps it understand that there is a soft edge here and that the pattern that it's looking for may be mixing with the background as well. And all right, so let's go through and get this done a piece at a time. Just blurring this out on the edges. No problem. This part takes a little bit of time, but if you consider that I don't want to have to roto thousands upon thousands of frames, doing the four to six frames that I'll do, depending on the complexity of the movement, uh, I'll only do 46 frames of rotoscope to train Copycat on how to do its job. I want to find frames in my timeline that are at different states, uh, different angles of my face, different angles of my head and body. Is it motion blurred? I want to do some with motion blur. Here you can see I'm pulling this hair out so you can see that it's looking for a soft feature here. Try to match the outside line of my fuzzy hair since I've got blonde hair on a white wall it's it's another case of of measure twice cut once where I cut once and measured once uh, but I want to find frames where everything is in focus and I want to find th frames where everything is motion blurred so that copycat learns how to find this pattern no matter what frame it's on and again, the cleaner the background, the better it's going to do. But in this particular case, again, this video was originally shot as, as a quick afterthought. Now, if I hold down Control, 
while I'm clicking these handles, I can adjust the angle of it without, uh, without changing the position of the other side. So as I get through on this, there we go, a little at a time. There we go. Almost there. Adjust this edge. Just uh, time that up. And move on down. So close. This is why rotoscope is so frustrating. But at some point in every visual effects artist's life, you have to buck up and realize that you're not going to get away from doing rotoscope. Embrace the rotoscope. Ultimately, it will be your friend, even though it is a pain in the ass. This is why I like having Copycat in here, because it actually gives me the ability to uh, rotoscope without a lot of time. I mean, traditionally, especially in large studios like the ones I work in now, uh, we send this off to an outsource vendor. Well, they'll have 5,000 people rotoring every hair of every frame for thousands and thousands of frames, and then we just get the rotoscope back. So there's entire companies that do this in mass. I'm gonna move a couple of frames forward, create a new frame hold, and I will set that to the current frame by hitting this button, or if you create it on that frame, it'll already be there. Hit O for the new rotoscope node, and then once again, rinse and repeat. Instead of boring you through this, I'm going to go ahead and fast forward so that we can uh, see this in action. Okay, now that we've moved our head a little bit, I'm going to go ahead and just paste in some extra rotoscope that I did for this shot originally, just to save a little bit of time, because who wants to reinvent the wheel? So here we go. Paste. Bang. And then I'm going to hook these up to my frame range output so that all of my frames are where they need to be. Just know that it took me as long as it did for each one of these frames, but now I can see that each one's rotoscope, basically, come on, there we go. This is one where I did the head and the body separately, as you can see in here. Oh, there's the head. So, as I can see, all of this roto lines up with what I'm looking to do. And there's the body. Great. Good job, me. My head and body. Uh, on this... Uh, each one of these, you know, of course, is going to line up with the frame that it's at. Frame hold. There we go. So now that I've got this in here, I'm going to create a append clip node. And on each one of these, I'm going to set this up to uh, connect to each one of my shots. One, two, three, four five and six. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to change this frame, first frame to 1001 because that is where my footage is starting. And then I'm going to go into the sequence settings. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, yep, all the rotos are selected. Each one of these gets one frame a piece. So that's six frames. So I know that it's going to go from 1001 to 1006. So I'm going to go into my sequence settings, and I'm going to just change that to 006, and there we go. So now, if I go back in my timeline uh, on this append clip, go back to this, and then hit each frame forward is going to jump to those frames that I've held and their subsequent roto. Hit play, and we just get some max headroom there. from this append clip. Okay, I'm gonna create another dot, and then I'm gonna take this, and I'm gonna create a remove node. And I'm gonna plug this off to the side. This is gonna be my main input remove. Get rid of all that, keep that clean. Okay, so in my remove node, I'm gonna set this to, uh, let's just set that to one. Um, 
I'm going to set this remove node to keep because I only want to keep the red, green, and blue channels. Keep, and then the next one, I'm going to set this to RGB, not RGBA, because I just want to keep the primary colors. And that's going to be my main input for the copycat node. So now I'm going to go to the other side of this and I'm going to create a shuffle node down here. Shuffle. There we go. And in this, I'm going to remove every channel and make the red channel my primary alpha for these. So I'm going to basically take the alpha input from those rotoscopes, park it into the red channel, and then I'm going to change every other channel to black because Copycat only works on the red channel input. So if you have it in anywhere else, your Copycat will not know. Work. So having all of my alpha on red, now if I line these up, I'm going to change this to red alpha so that we know exactly what it is we're working with. Uh, after this, I'm going to add another remove node here, and this time I'm going to I'm going to keep once again set this to keep. This time I'm going to set it to RGBA because I want to keep that alpha. But then I'm going to turn off every channel except the red because I just want the red channel to come through, and I want everything else to be off. So now. red copycat well I guess I'll finish this copycat and I'm going to plug the input into this red green and blue and the ground truth is going to get plugged into the copycat roto red channel node so now I need to come up with a I need to come up with a folder that I'm going to have this train to in my settings so I will click on the data directory and I will find a place that I want to put this in this case I'll put it in the color correction I'm, I like to create a new folder for each one because it does fill it up um, this will be shot 035 and we'll call this uh, underscore V uh, training V02 create that folder oh, another zero there okay and now I will hit open and that will be the folder that it saves all this to now, I'm gonna leave the default 10,000 iterations but before I hit start training I'm gonna drop down advanced and I'm gonna change this to human matting this helps it do a better job figuring out what to do the rest of these I'm gonna leave at default and I'm just gonna hit start training this is where this is going to take several hours, depending on how many iterations I have it do and the complexity and the number of rotos that I have. I've had this take up to four hours sometimes. So sometimes I might just do the rotoscope at the end of the night and go to bed and let it run all night. Or I might go to dinner if it's something that's only an hour or too long and come back and see how it is. And then with either of those, whenever I come back to it, I'll pick it up from where I left off and uh, if it needs more training I'll give it more training if not then I'll just create the inference and run with it from there now right now you can look in these columns uh, there, there's three columns in this grid that is created the first column is just the footage the second column is the red rotoscope that I created and the third column is what it's trying to figure out as you can see, slowly but surely, it does a better job. That first one looked like a shotgun blast. This one, it's got a little bit right, but then it's got a little bit wrong. And as this runs for the next couple of hours, it will eventually get to a point where the ground truth and the output look really, really close. That's when you know you've got a pretty good training. Uh, but generally, I just let it run its course because then it does it does a good job. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and let this run, and then I'll come back to it uh, once it has finished doing its bit. <coughs> now, eventually, once this thing finishes running, then I'm going to get <coughs> this button that says Create Inference. If I create this inference, it's going to create this. This is what I'm going to use to get the rest of my footage. Get rid of those. 
pause for a second. So now, if I go back up here to the top, I have to do two things to test this. One, I'm going to hook this up to my footage, and I'm going to look from there. Now, what I should see is just a red frame. Perfect. Now, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to set this to 1138, <coughs> which was the original end of my footage here. So once that's back, now I can test to see if this inference is going to do good. If I go into this inference node here, I can actually say optimize for speed and memory, but I'm not going to do that right now, because what I want to first do is just see that it's actually going to take my footage and rotoscope me out. <coughs> now the thing about this is, it's actually not perfect, but for a lot of this, it's good enough, and what I can do if I want to get a better roto out of it is I can actually add epochs to this let's say I double this and then I can resume training and it'll go through and it will add extra bits of of training to this and give me a better thing and then and I'm gonna say this a lot if that still doesn't work then it's time to man up and roto like a professional because there is no professional out there who doesn't occasionally have to rotoscope their own things. So, <clears throat> once I know that my inference is actually doing what it's supposed to, and you can see that I didn't rotoscope all these frames, it's figuring it out on its own. So it has learned well enough how to get me rotoscoped out in such a way that I know that I'm getting a pretty good match on the footage. Now again, there's holes in the head. But what I found for some of those things, especially since it's blonde hair on a white background, the easiest thing for me to do is just to patch those holes with some simple roto in the shots where it becomes a problem. Because it's usually only a few frames, and it takes less time to do that than to run another inference. Because that's going to take several hours of my time, or a couple minutes to knock, to knock that hole out with simple roto. So... <clears throat> For comparison, if I go through here to number two here, then I can see that I'm getting a pretty good match anywhere that I go with my rotoscoped footage. Ah, there's a hole in my head, but you can see why it's following that, uh, that line of action here. But again, a simple roto is easy enough to knock that out because a couple frames later and it's not going to be there. So it's not a perfect system, but it beats the hell out of trying to rotoscope all of this stuff by hand, especially since <coughs> I've got shot after shot after shot of all of this stuff. And if I go back to my shot list here, and let's say we look at uh, shot 50. If I bring in uh, a read node here and go into plate for shot 50, then even though I didn't train on shot 50, what I can see really quickly is that if I add this inference to this and then look at this as number one, then even though it's different, it's still gonna get my inference right. Go back to another frame. Come on. So it's doing the job that I need it to. Even though I didn't train on shot 50, it's still giving me decent roto. And that's what the power of the copycat system is. It allows me to train on one or two plates and then utilize that for 30 or 40 shots so that I can get good enough roto out of what's effectively bad lighting conditions um, to get this shot done. So now that you've seen how I did the rotoscope on these shots, and I had to do this for every different camera angle because it's not gonna work across camera angles. It'll work for the same camera angle, but not from angle to angle to angle. So uh, next up, I'm gonna sh start showing you how I built the comp and what it took to do that. 
So in this, this is my basic comp setup. And as you can see, it's relatively simple comp, but I wanted something that looked sort of hand drawn and, and cut out. Uh, and I wanted it to do it something that I could reuse the same setup over and over again and be quick with it. Because again, the idea of this is to get it done very fast. I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to uh, reinvent the wheel here. I just want something that I could do quickly, since I don't have months and months of a 10-person team to get these music videos done. So let me show you how I built this script. Starting with a blank nuke screen here, I'm going to open up. I'm going to do shot 9, because why not? I'm going to do a read node, easy enough, and I'm going to go into shot 9 plate and just grab this plate as it stands here. Now this is a case where uh, I hadn't yet realized that how I was exporting these out of uh, Resolve was inappropriately numbered. So I'm going to start at and set this to 1001 so that I get my right frame range and then I'm going to set this to 1001 to Damn it, what was my last number? Uh, 72, 94, so that's going to be... It's going to be 1001 to 1170. I believe that should be it. And in this particular case, I'm going to get my footage size 27 by that. And change this to that so that I've got everything set to the same frame format, this, that, and the other. So if I rewind this now, then I should get my plate <coughs> playing as expected. Now the first thing that I'm going to do for this is I want to give this an alpha because right now if I go to my alpha channel it's just black and I'm going to need that alpha later on. So I'm going to add a shuffle node and then I'm going to set the alpha to white. Easy peasy. I'm going to change this to only two nodes at a time so I can keep my properties a little clean. Now I always like to add a dot because they keep you separated and you can do that just by hitting the period key. Now, at this point, I'm going to take and create an inference. And then I'm going to plug that in here. And of course, I'm going to get an error because the one thing that I need to do is I need to go to my cat training and get my, my, my footage. So since I know where that is, I'm going to paste this in here. And then I'm going to take the latest and greatest of these cat training files, and that's going to be, I think, which one was it? It was, if I go in here, uh, we should have one for 10,000. There it is, 10,000 cat 22. So this is my latest and greatest of all the training in here for this shot. I'm going to hit open, and then... <coughs> That should go ahead and give me my inference. And if I check this against my plate, it lines up. Great. So now, I've done a couple of things here. One is I'm going to make another dot by hitting the period key. And I'm going to push this off to the side so that I have a branch for my footage and I'm going to have a branch for my rotoscope. Now because I know that I'm going to have to do a little bit of uh, roto in here to patch in some holes occasionally and as well to, to mark out certain things like if I wanted to add the guitar head or if I wanted to especially take out the microphone or something like that, treat it differently, then I'm going to use this roto node for that. <coughs> so for this, from my inference, I'm going to create another shuffle node, and on this one, just because I want to make sure that everything kind of keeps its nuts together, I'm going to go into this, and I'm going to have the red channel feed into every other channel. 
once I've got all of my channels in here, which you know will give me now just a flat alpha that I can work with later on. Now, um, just for grins and giggles, I'm going to go ahead and hit the O key and create a rotoscope here. But for the moment, I'm not going to do anything with that because I don't know that I need to rotoscope out anything. And then once again, I'm going to put a classic period here so I got my control dot because I know I'm going to need that later. <clears throat> so now, let's start working on getting the look that I want for this video. Um, and I'm going to do that in a couple of ways. I'm going to start with an edge detect way out here. And in that edge detect, I'm going to edge detect. Now for this one, I'm going to change this once I connect it. I'll go to one. I'm going to change this to pre-wit because I liked what I got out of it. I'm going to change this to RGBA so that I'm affecting not only the color but also the output. I'm going to set my threshold to 0.3 and again this was just kind of uh, a little bit of trial and error on my side to get what I wanted out of it. I'm going to set my blur size to 2.5 although I think that if I'm going to be honest that's when I was eroding something out and I just never set set that data back. But now, if I look at the alpha of this, I get a really nice <coughs> set of edges on the outside. Now, this edge blur is going to be, I'm going to do two edge detects. One for the room, and one for me. Because I want less of an edge on me than I do on the, on the rest of the image. So, this one's just going to be for the room. Now... <coughs> I'm also going to need to subtract myself from this. So this is where I'm going to start creating a second edge detect. And this one, I'm going to hook to this dot here. Let's go to the one. And on this one, I'm going to change my settings. I'm going to leave the Sobel as it is. I am going to change this to RGBA. And I'm going to set the threshold to 0.8 because I want it to be much less. And now that I've got that, I'm going to create a grade node under this by hitting the G key or by typing grade. Either one works. In this case, G is definitely much faster. And I'm going to set my black, I'm going to change this to RGBA because I want it to affect the alpha as well as the color. I'm going to set my black point to 0.4 and I'm going to set my white point to 1.31. And this was just, again, a little bit of trial and error until I got the, the look I wanted on this. And the rest of these, I'm going to leave the same because I just wanted to kind of minimize how much you can see how much I'm pushing down those lines on here. <laughs> now, I like to use multiplies to subtract things out, but it's not the only way to do it. There's There's couple other ways you can you can subtract things but because I like to just do the multiply I'm going to create a multiply math node and I'm going to set this to zero and you're going to immediately see that it's going to take everything that I popped into it and just pull it away now this is where I'm going to go into my roto so I'm going to take my mask plug it into the end of my roto and then I'm going to invert that mask so the only thing I'm getting is the lines on the front of me now, because I need to A over B this stuff, I'm going to take Edge Detect, and I'm going to create a Merge node here. Uh, then I'm going to take this Merge and plug it into here. But, let's look from this so we see what we're getting. I'm going to take the mask, and I'm going to park that back into here. And then I'm going to make sure that my mask on that is set to invert. So now I have my light lines over me and my dark lines over the background. But we ain't done yet. So to get all of this to show up in the RGBA, because right now this is what we're looking at. 
And as you can see, that's just kind of funky. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take after this node, I'm gonna create another shuffle node. And this time, I'm gonna shuffle the alpha into all the other color channels so that I am left with nothing but my line work. Now, next up, I'm going to create a primary set of colors. I'm going to create a constant, constant, and in this constant, I'm going to change this to RGBA, and then I'm going to go ahead and change this to a beige color. So we'll call this beige, learn how to spell, there we go beige and then um, I'm gonna go into the color wheel and I'm gonna pull up the alpha to be something bright and I pull this up here and then I'm gonna find a beige that gives me roughly the color that I'm looking for and in this case I actually know some numbers so I'm just gonna type some of these in really quick to give you the exact color that I have before because hey you know what I know it because I literally actually you know what to make this even faster I'm gonna copy and paste the beige that I used so that I get exactly what it is I'm after and to that note I'm gonna create another constant node and I'm going to constant I'm going to make this one dark brown <clears throat> so these are the two constants that I'm going to make now under this I'm gonna take this and go a over B and create a merge node so that what I'm getting now is effectively this dark brown color but I'm gonna take this shuffle and I'm going to turn this into the mask so this is now what I get but I'm not totally happy with that in and of itself because it's it's frankly it's very straight and I wanted to give it a bit of an animated sort of look to it so what I did how I do it what I did was I took from the beige and I created a noise. And in that noise, I then set this to RGBA, which it was. I left the pre mult alone. Format's good. This, that, and the other. FBM was fine. I set this to 260 so that I get a tighter noise. And then I created a script here, add expression. And I want to do this by the frame, but I'm going to do a little math on it. So. I'm going to open this up and I'm going to say frame, but I'm going to remove the 1,001 frames that I put at the head of the shot. So I'm removing 1,000, and then I'm going to divide this by the radius of a circle, 360 degrees, and then I'm lastly, I'm going to add a 0 0.8 because that's... Uh, it's just the threshold that I was working with from the noise. By doing this, I should now get a little motion in that. Now the lacunarity, I'm going to set this to 2.22, so I get a little tighter bit. The gain, I'm going to set to 0 0.635, and the gamma, I'm going to set to 0 0.61. Now these were just some things that I did to test this before before I did much else with it. Now in here, this is where I'm gonna get a little tricky with it. Um, in, the, in the transform, I'm gonna move this around to negative 212, and this, this particular case, I'm centering this around my body. So if I do this, then I, or was it around my head? Around my head. So center this around my head because I want to get that roughly about where my head is. And there's a reason for this. 
And the reason is that I'm going to take the scale and I'm going to set an expression here that is going to do, uh, once again, frame, frame minus 1,000 because I need to get rid of that 1,001 frames. And then I'm going to multiply this. Um, and I did a little testing on this to get it right. 0 0.0075. And then I'm going to add 0 0.0075. 75 to the end of this and that's going to give me a scale that's going to change over time so that as I run this back the scale of my noise is going to move outward from roughly where my head is okay so that's giving me a bit of that. Now the next thing that I'm going to do on this, assuming that I've got everything else the same, oh yeah, I'm going to take in the color of this noise, and uh, because I already have it somewhere else, I'm going to just take this noise and I'm going to make it the same beige color. Damn it, come on. Uh, you know what? We're just going to make some number choices here. Get rid of that. We're going to say that we want this to be a little in the beige direction. And then I'm going to pull down the overall bit here until I start to get something that feels about right to me. It should really be somewhere in there. And this is giving my noise a bit of, uh, you know. Let's see here. Somewhere in there is fine for what I need. It's close enough. Okay, so now I've got my noise, but I don't want my noise to just uh, do what it's doing there. So I'm going to take, and I'm going to create a radial. After this, radial. And I'm going to adjust the settings on this so that it goes out all the way to the edge of the frame but more so I'm going to set this over to basically be in the same sort of place right around my head because I want this to kind of flare out from me in the center point <coughs> and then the uh, other things that I've done on this on this radio is I've actually created a smooth ramp in the color channel. And I'm doing this ramp across here to help walk off to darken where I'm not. Because I want this to be a little more controlled around the subject. Uh, in this, let's see here, I did change the color of this just a bit, just in the one to here to be brighter color. So this I set to 1.26, super white. This was set to 1, this was set to 0 0.91, and that gave me the ramp color. So now I've got my radial and my ramp, and that gives me this nice hot bit here. I didn't do anything else with that, but that gives me the basic setup for what's coming next. So what's coming next? This is where I start to bring this back in over the plate. So for the plate, I needed to separate out myself from the color as well. So I'm going to create another dot here. 
and I'm going to pull this down, and I'm going to use a multiply on that math, because I like to just subtract things. And from that, I'm going to take the mask, plug it into the roto. Let's look from here. I'm going to set this to zero, and then I'm going to invert the mask to where this jerk is the only thing that I'm seeing. Now on this, I'm going to take the color correct, and I'm going to adjust the colors of this down so that I can just hit the C key on this. C, there's my color correct. Now I want to desaturate it. I'm going to knock that down to 0.03 because I want almost no color in this. I'm going to add the color in myself. Now for the gamma, I'm changing the color in the gamma because I don't want to affect the, the light and dark values. I just want the color in between. So I'm going to set this one to 1.25. I'm going to set this one to 1.123 and this one to 1.03. And the alpha to 1.25. The gain, I'm also going to set to 1.25. And the offset, I'm going to set to negative uh, 0 0.045. That kind of crushes that down. Now for the midtones, I changed some of the work in there as well. So once again, changing the gamma color. And again, the gamma affects everything that's not white or black. It's all the values in between. I'm going to set the red to 2.09, and the green to 1.53, and the blue to 1.46, and then the alpha, I'm going to set to 2.2. The gain, I'm going to set colors on this as well. On this, I'm going to set the red, I'm going to leave the red at 1, I'm going to set the green to 0 0.992, and the blue to 0.891. That'll help kind of pull that gain down just a little bit. Um, and I think that's about all I did on the color for that. Other than that, I added another grade node by hitting the G key down here, and in the grade... I'm again pushing some of the color. In this case, I'm taking the gain, and I'm going to set this to 0 0.902 in the green, 0 0.81 in the blue, and then I'm going to set the white clamp on as well so that it's clamping the white values as well as the black values. Oh, there's Disney. Thanks, Disney. Um... Let's see here. Let's go back to our line work for a minute because I need to take this merge node that I've created and add some distortion to it. And how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? That's the easy fun part. So I'm going to create a copy node, and I'm going to plug that into the B channel output of this. And I'm going to look through this, and this is where this becomes important, because while I'm looking through this, I'm going to go up here in my viewport, and I'm going to go to New. And in the New, I'm going to create I Distort. And for this, in the channels, I'm going to create a U and a V. UV channels. So now, in this I distort, I should see that I have that in there. That's great. Now, I'm going to create another noise node. And in this noise node, I'm going to change this to RGBA. It already is set up. Great. I'm going to change this to turbulence and I'm going to change my XY size to 68 because I want a small noise. Let's look at this noise here. Oh, and I have to set this back to RGBA to see the noise. Now I'm going to go over here and in my expression for the Z, I'm going to do something that cycles. So I'm going to go Take the sine 
sin of the frame, divide that by 2, and then I'm going to add 1. And this will keep it from going below 0, because I want this to cycle between 1 and 2, and not negative 1 and 1. So I'm adding 1 to the end of this, so that now, when I play this, I get a nice warbly sort of jitter. But I'm going to take my lacunarity and I'm going to change that to 1.25. I'm going to change my gamma to 0.73 to kind of push that up toward the white. And then, let's see here, I think that's about all I did on this. Oh, other than I want to make sure that the red color that the color is set to a nice bright red because I need basically, you know, I can just set these two to zero. Zero, zero, because I need this to be red. But I need this to end up being red and green. So I'm going to create another constant node. And this one I'm just going to set to pure green, all the way up green. And I'm going to park that into the input of the noise to where I get this shape. And when I play it, I get a fun jittery kind of noise that jumps back and forth. You can see that the noise is repeating itself over and over again, back and forth. If I look at any one point on this, you'll see the same shape appearing because I'm using a sine wave to drive the shape of the noise so that I get a jitter back and forth. And that's what I want in this case. So now that I've got that noise, I'm going to plug that into the A channel of this copy. So now if I look at this copy here, I should just see this. But let's go back into my copy node. I'm going to say that the red channel and the green channel of this should go into the I distort U and I distort V of this. So now if I'm looking at my, my output and I go into the eye distort, I should see that. This is, a, this is effectively a render layer, so I'm adding, I'm copying that noise into a special property into my footage so that any time I want to pull that footage out, I can. And that's exactly what I want to do. I want to take and create an eye distort transform node, and I'm going to plug that straight into my channel here and I'm going to look for this out of this. By default that's not going to do a whole lot of anything. So I'm going to set this just to RGBA for my channels because I don't want it to affect anything else. And here is where I'm going to take that eye distort that I created and plug it in as my inset. So now I'm going to change this to 1 and this to 10 because I really want to jitter this up. And look at that, right off the bat, you can see that it's wiggling my lines and making it look a little more hand-drawn. The only other thing that I did on this was I cranked the blur scale up to 8 so that I get a little more of a, a blur on, on the uh, thing. But when, now when I play this, what you'll see, and this will take a little longer to process, but it's basically going to jitter using the eye distort it's going to jitter all my lines so that I'm getting a nice wavy pattern that looks like it repeats over and over again in a small space and it jitters that across the entire amount of footage so that I'm getting a nearly hand-drawn look it doesn't look hand-drawn but it looks more hand-drawn than than uh than if I didn't go this route. There are other ways to do this, but again, this had to be cheap, fast, and easy. So now, now that I've got my eye distort, and I'll just like, I'll set an in and an out frame here for, for a short period of time so you can see what it's doing, and then play that. So you can see I'm getting this nice jittered line over and over again with this, and that's what I wanted. I wanted something that looked relatively hand-drawn. Come on, go away. Oh, oh, turn off. There you go. So, now that I've got my eye distort, I'm going to create over here a 
merge node, but I'm going to set this merge node to soft light for my transform because I don't want it to be overly uh, overly done. So I'm going to take the B channel, park it into there, so that I'm getting that, and then I'm going to take the color channel, park it into that, so that I'm getting a bit of footage through through my thing. But I'm going to take the mask channel of this, plug this into here, and I'm going to change this to invert so that I'm getting a darker bit on here, a lighter bit on the inside. But that's not all. From here, I'm going to go ahead and create God Rays. God Rays, I'm going to set up with the center being right around my face. I feel like I'm missing a step somewhere. It'll all work out. It always does. The God Rays, I'm also going to plug into the mask here. And once again, I'm going to invert the mask because I want it to go around the right place. And so I'm going to set my translate to 5 and 2 and my rotate to 1. And my Oh, and the reason that I'm doing this is to, to kind of warp this around the side. So I'm cycling my god rays to, to help it fall off the further from me that it gets. Get it? There we go. Okay. I'm going to set the scale to 0 0.01 to stretch it beyond the frame. Center I've got set. The rest of this I'm going to leave at its default. And I'm just using the God Rays to, to effectively give me something like a radial blur, but not quite a radial blur. The five steps is fine for what I needed to do. Okay, so... From here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lower all of this down just a little bit because I'm going to add another knot here. And for this knot, I'm going to go ahead and create another knot over here. Tie these two together because now that I've got this, I'm going to feed my image back in on itself. A few times, I'm going to take a, another merge from here. Hit the M key to get my merge. But I'm going to hit Shift B or shift X, sorry, to switch this from B to A so that now I'm laying myself back over top of me. But I'm also going to take the mask, plug it back into here, and then I'm going to set the transform of this to minimum so that I'm affecting just what's inside. Then... <laughs> Long pause. Then I'm going to take a color correct and I'm going to plug this into this channel of my face. So we're still looking at this. And in this particular color correct, I'm going to boost it just a little bit. I'm going to set my saturation to 0 0.15, 0 0.015, pardon me, 0 0.015, so that I'm bringing that way down. I'm going to change the contrast to 1.4 to make that hotter. The gamma, I'm going to set to 0 0.74 to crush that in toward... Uh, keeping the shirt and stuff black while keeping my face overly white. Then I'm going to add just a little bit of color to the gain of this. I'm going to change these to 1.017, uh, this one to 0 0.915, this one to 0 0.917, and then the alpha to 0.8. For. And the rest of these I'm going to leave alone. And then I'm going to take that copy and I'm going to put that in another merge 
from here and merge A over B, M to get my merge, to pull that forward like that. And I'm going to set this one to overlay. For the mask, though, I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to create a multiply out here, off to the side, and I'm going to run that multiply into my mask. And then I will set that multiply to zero. There we go. And for this mask, I'm going to create a ramp. And on the ramp, ramp, I love ramps. I'm going to set the mask of this to a ramp here. And this ramp, I'm going to run my P1 up here. I'm kind of doing it a bit across, across me just up to about the the mouth so that I get more of a fall off toward the end and then this is the mask that I'm going to plug into oh yeah and this multiply I need to once again invert I'm going to take this output this overlay and mask that into that so now I get a stronger set of colors toward the end of this, not so much at the beginning. So, now that I've got that uh, on my output here, give me a second channel, this one, let's close all this. I'm gonna create a denoise filter. And on the denoise, I'm gonna set my low cutis here where did it go up to some place on the wall it's relatively flat and simple then I'm going to set this to lift the blacks I'm going to set this to automatic and I'm going to set the denoise amount to 3 I'm going to sleeve the roll off and the rest of this the way it is should be fine. Although, did I change the profile on that? Might have. It's fine. Lastly, I've got, well, not quite lastly. Lastly, I'm going to put another color correct after this, and I'm going to set this saturation to 1.05, to saturate it up a bit, and then I'm going to change the contrast to 1.35 so that I get more of that hot burn around me. Now the coup de grace to get this to work is that I wanted it to look um, choppy. Well, not choppy, but more like a, a stepped frame. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a frame hold right here at the end. I'm gonna set this to 1001, but I'm gonna increment it every three frames. And what this is gonna do is it's going to make this feel more like a paper cutout. I feel like something in my noise got uh, slightly off color. I'll leave this one here, because that's not quite right. But you know what, um, ultimately, this took a lot of tweaking to get to the final look. So now if I play this, what I'm getting is a very stepped feeling. I'll let it cycle through. Cycling through. You can see some of the holes are happening in my hair and I'll show you how I fix those next because that actually took less time than trying to retrain it the the like I said the copycat mostly did a good job getting the look that I wanted out of this and rotoscoping for me but it's not perfect as you can see there holes in the head we're gonna fix that 
But again, that's that's actually super easy. I'll let this finish cycling through. So you can see what it's going to do. But actually, I'll hit the back button so you can kind of get how it has that stepped feel. Every three frames is all it's playing. So that we get a more animated paper cutout sort of feel from this. The lines are jittering. Here we go. Well, you know, I bet you that I didn't have this all the way up. Did I pull that down? All right, before I tweak trying to get this to look exactly like the original, let's go in and deal with this roto node that we created relatively early on. So now I need to find where my holes are. Okay, there's a hole. So all I'm going to do for this is I'm going to find the first frame where I've got a hole. I don't remember accidentally creating a bezier. So we'll that for the moment. And we will just take and make a quick little roto shape right in here for this that adds it adds that in and then stretch this up to give it the same kind of blurred edge uh, and then in this clearly there's something else going on there my hair wasn't that tall or how you know. um, for this what I'll do is I will go ahead and set this for a range a frame range and I'm going to set that to 9, because I know that it's only going to go a couple of frames. So now, the next frame seems to be fine. Click off this. Then we find the next hole. There it is. This one seems to go across 2, so I'll start here. Once again, create a new roto. Put this in like that. Fill my hole. Pull this up. Get my, my nice bit of there, and I'll set a range that goes from, it, it takes the start range from wherever you own, wherever you put it. So we know it's at 22, I know 24 would be the next, but then we got to add 3, so that's going to be 27. So now this should fill in that hole, and here I can just animate, move it to the next place where there's a hole. Oh, you know what? I'm going to change that range to include uh, 28, 29, 30. Go to 30. 30. Easy. Fill that in here. I might have to adjust my shape a little bit. Pull that, pull that fade up. Now, in some of this, it could be that my hair is too... T that the, the roto is too tall. So what I can do also is I can create another roto that goes in here and effectively cuts off places where I don't actually want the roto to go. You know, for instance, if this is stretching the hair up, take this down like this. Let's add the hit the Z key to round that out so I can pull this out that way. And then on this, I just change this to minus, and it'll subtract that out. And the further that my fades are, the more that'll blend in with the rest of the background to get these kind of smoother shapes so that I'm not pinching. into that. There we go. Find, find the place where it blends the most. And then, of course, on this, I'm going to change this to frame range uh, 22, 
230 as well. So that if I go back a few frames, it cuts that hair off so that it doesn't look wrong. So this is effectively how I'm patching the holes. And you can see that this is actually not as much work as waiting a couple hours for it to retrain. So anytime I find a hole or something like that, I can just create a new quick rotor shape to pull these out and effectively get on with my life because that's what I'm doing. And since this one's going to be subtractive, again, well, I'm going to select all these at once and just do a uh, much faster. Uh, sometimes that's a pain. And then once again, once I have this kind of stretched out, then I just set this to minus. And I give that a range as well so that I'm only going to deal with it on the frames where it matters. And change this to 35 because I think I was going backwards there. Nah, whatever. It's fine. But ultimately, this is the method that I would use to get rid of holes and things like that so that when I run into something funky, I can just patch it in quickly rather than trying to rotoscope the entire thing. And except for a few places where I must have missed some color step. And again, a lot of this is just dealing with how you want the colors to, to read on this. You know, do I want it to, to dial in to be a little more? Because that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to give just a hint of noise without the noise being overly egregious. So dialing in some of these values is relatively easy to do. Once you have your basic setup, then you can dial in, you know, the size of the noise, how much you want to, and with the ramp, I'm cutting that off. And by having it do the scale, then it, it appears to emanate from my head as, as the shot moves out. Um, and really, I was just trying to add some extra motion to this to give it a little more play so that as it went through, I get these, these grand moments in an otherwise fairly hand-drawn look. So that, was, that process was repeated for every one of the different kinds of shots that I did. The only other thing that, uh, that, that would change, um, let, me, let me close this comp, uh, I'll save it. That's a good idea, right? Save your work. Uh, nothing new, documentary, um, comp, Boo -boo. Um, and in shot oh, 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 009, we, uh, we'll call this shot doc B009. go that's closed um, the only other things that I might have done let me go back to this so um, I can't say this enough good organization is also a good part of how I got this show done quickly so let me pull this this over onto this other monitor so you can see what it is this is a very simple effectively this is a simple shot list where I have everything that I've done for every camera angle that I've got select all that so that I can see and this is after I've worked it I can add notes to myself where I think I need more training I, I can separate this out to where the blue ones are things that I have done training on green ones are notes that I've hit green over in the shot column is effectively the shots that I've completed and by doing this, what I'm allowing myself to do, once I have a nuke script that works for a given series of shots, then I can go through and I can say, okay, let's just do bass guitar shots. And then here is my bass guitars. And so I can basically just take uh, a script like this and take all of this node 
select all of this, copy it, go to the next shot, new comp, eventually, new comp, here we go, ah. close, paste this in here, get my new footage, let's go to, we'll just reuse shot 9, no we won't, let's go to shot, um, shot 50 I think was one we used earlier, shot 50, hit next, plug this into here, plug in our output, and instantly making sure that we have this set up, we get our next shot done just by using a copy and paste method. The only thing that I've got to do for this now is to go through and rotoscope whatever needs to get rotoscoped, if I have holes in the shirt or what have you. I could even create this into a group node and then just repeat that over and over again. And as soon as I get one done, I go back to my list, I mark it off as green. If there's a problem with it, I might mark this whole column as being like uh, red or something like this. Now, in the pro world, we use shotgun, shot grid, whatever you want to call it. And I have done that for personal projects as well. But honestly, it's 35 to 50 bucks a month for shotgun, shot grid, they changed the name, per user. And this is a, a way to get this done for much cheaper since I'm just using a Google Sheet to make sure that I have all my shots done. So again, going back to this, once I have my, uh, once I have my shot list and I do the first one of these shots, I can copy and paste that to every other shot in a given angle. And so if I want to just look at all the angle one shots, then here I go, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, render, 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 and then drop them back into my timeline. And before I know it, I have every one of these bass guitar angle one shots done in like 30 minutes to an hour because I've already done my training and I've already set up my comp from here on out it's copy paste render copy paste render copy paste render and then I go and I train the next angle I go into angle three of this and then I take these and I train this one and I leave that training a lot of times I'd step away for dinner go to bed and let it train if it was going to be exceptionally long, and then copy and paste in the same nuke script, do the tweaks I need for this particular angle, and then once I have one of those shots done, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, over and over again. By having good organization like this, you actually save yourself a bunch of time because I can just focus on the drums for a while and say, okay, let's take all of my drum angles Let's find out which ones I've got that I'm using. Start with the angle twos, get those done. There's only three of those shots, copy, paste, copy, paste. And before you know it, you've done three months worth of work in, in a couple of weeks of working at night. You know, because I still work full time in the day, um, but at night I will spend a couple hours a day just working on this stuff to try to get them done as quickly as possible. And these kinds of shot lists make this such a much easier process to deal with than trying to just do it in sequence. Because when you do it in sequence, when you go from shot one to shot two, they're different instruments, they're different angles, they're different, they're different setups. And sometimes the amount of work to go between those takes more time than just to do all of the like shots at once. If you have five shots that are all the same camera angle, do them as a group because you'll get it done faster, they'll look more consistent, and then when you bring them back into the timeline, you're going to be happier with what you end up with because it's going to look exactly the same from shot to shot. Well, thank you very much for taking a look at my video. I'll be putting more of these out as time goes by. Every time I do a music video, I plan on releasing a video showing how I did the work so that you can find some inspiration and some new techniques for getting your own work done and getting that out into the world as I have done. Uh, if you like and subscribe, of course, that helps, uh, helps me make more of these videos. 
And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments or uh, you can directly message me through my website at adamdbenson.com. Thank you again and until next time.